Um, in today's seminar, I'll start off by talking about successful specification, design, and inspection of hot dip galvanizing, especially for steel bridges, and then also kind of follow that with a short presentation on the benefits and specification of galvanized rebar. Um, in addition to explaining the overall hot dip galvanizing process, the goal is to learn uh, why hot dip galvanizing is specified for bridges and rebar and what to expect in terms of specification, design, uh, performance, and inspection. Before we begin, I'll just give you a little background information about the American Galvanizers Association. We are a nonprofit trade association established in 1933, and we really serve as a unified voice and we provide expertise in the after fabrication hot dip galvanizing industry. We provide technical uh, support for North American specifiers, and we're also a marketing and technical resource for our galvanizing members. So when we talk about planning for the future and, and hot to galvanize steel bridges, uh, we know that in 2017, it was determined that about 9% or about 56,000 bridges in North America were deemed structurally deficient because of steel corrosion, especially in urban environments. And as a result, bridge designers in general have become more sensitive to kind of sustainability issues, budget issues, and overall life cycle costs. And so the concept of a 100-year bridge with minimal maintenance has really become a big goal for future projects. Fortunately, there are ways um, that we can use to combat this costly and damaging corrosion and use that to help preserve our nation's infrastructure. Um, significant strides in using hot to galvanize bridges have been made in the short span bridge market, which actually accounts for 50% of all the bridges in the U.S. Uh, Melissa did mention to you about the short span steel bridge alliance, the SSSBA, and that they provide educational information on the design and construction of short span steel bridges for uh, bridges and installations up to 140 feet in length. In response to concerns that uh, short span steel bridges are not economical or that they can be difficult to design, the SSSBA actually developed a tool, eSpan140.com. Um, it's a design tool, and this helps county engineers bridge en and bridge owners um, design and then compare uh, steel designs to concrete bridges, um, including considerations for corrosion protection are also in, in, uh, provided in this tool. Um, for more information about the SSSBA and their activities, you can, of course, visit shortspansteelbridges.org. Um, next, I'll, I'd like to give you just a brief overview of the overall hot dip galvanizing process uh, before we talk about the design. This is an illustration that gives you kind of a visual overview of the process, um, which is to immerse the steel in a series of galvanizing process pretreatment tanks before immersion in the galvanizing bath. There are three main steps in, involved in this immersion process. Um, so that's surface preparation and then placement into the zinc bath. And then we have the cooling and inspection stages. Okay. First, the surface preparation stage, that's really the most important stage uh, because zinc is not going to react with unclean steel. So the pretreatment process itself is involved in three steps to ensure that you have the clean steel surface. The first is degreasing, which removes dirt, oils, and organic residues. Um, acid pickling step, which removes mill scale and oxides. And then finally flexing, and this removes any remaining oxides, but then also provides a protective layer on the steel in order to prevent any further oxides from forming um, until you can immerse that material in the galvanizing kettle. Um, during the actual galvanizing step of the process, uh, the material is immersed in a bath of 98% pure molten zinc, maintained at approximately uh, 820 to 850 degrees Fahrenheit. And while that steel is immersed in the galvanizing kettle, zinc reacts with iron in order to form a series of intermetallic alloy layers. Next, you have the actual inspection stage. And for hot dip galvanizing, this uh, stage is relatively quick and simple. You're mostly ensuring minimum coating thickness and coating appearance requirements are met according to the specification. 
Um, the AGA has a lot more detailed information on inspection on our website, and we also have an inspection course and an inspection app. And all of these are just tools that you can use. Um, they're for free um, and available through any smartphone store or through our website directly. Should you um, find bare spots or surface conditions during that inspection stage, which negatively affect the corrosion protection, or affect the parts intended use, then these areas are what we uh, consider for uh, evaluation for repair. That area to be repaired has to be within acceptable limits if it is found at the galvanizing plant and can be repaired in accordance with the standard ASTM A780. This has instructions for um, repair procedure and also materials that can be used for repair. If the bare area is larger than the specification allows at the galvanizing plant, that part must be stripped and regalvanized. However, in the field, if you're touching up a part, uh, there is no limit to repair size. If you want to learn more about um, touch up and repair uh, of galvanized coatings, the AGA actually has an instructional video series you can watch on our site for more information as well. All right, now that we've reviewed the overall galvanizing process, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what hot tip galvanizing achieves for bridge projects and how those benefits um, can play into the best design practices. Traditionally, um, hot tip galvanized steel is, is uh, specified primarily for its corrosion protection and especially in harsh uh, atmospheric environments. There are really three levels of corrosion protection afforded by the hot tip galvanizing. That first is barrier protection, where the zinc is providing a literal barrier between the steel and the environment. So as long as that barrier is intact, there is not going to be corrosion. Uh, this is the same uh, type of protection that like paint would uh, provide. If the hot dip galvanized coating is scratched or damaged in any way, the hot dip galvanizing also offers cathodic protection. Zinc is anodic to steel, and therefore it's going to sacrifice itself to protect the base steel until nearly um, all the nearby zinc is consumed, um, even protecting uh, small scratches up to a quarter inch in width on flat surfaces. Finally, hot dip galvanized coatings uh, develop a protective zinc patina, and this develops after natural exposure to wet and dry cycles in the environment. This really slows the corrosion rate to about 1 30th the rate of steel in the exact same application and environment, and takes about six months to two years to uh, develop. An example where hot dip galvanizing was selected for corrosion production was the Indian Mill Bre uh, Rehab Project in Ohio. Uh, this is where a bridge was rehabilitated and then upgraded to look very similar in appearance prior to um, some flood damage that had occurred in 2010. This rough installation environment and weather um, could cause substantial damage to other coating systems and future maintenance would be difficult in this application due to long winters and very short summers. So that durability and methods of corrosion protection were key aspects here. Another aspect of hot dip galvanizing is its proven durability. Um, hot dip galvanizing provides abrasion resistance as the coating is mostly comprised of zinc and iron intermetallic alloy layers. And these alloy layers are actually harder than the base steel itself. Um, and then because the coating is formed by a metallurgical reaction, the coating actually grows perpendicular to every single surface along the part and at the same rate, meaning that you also achieve complete and uniform coverage over surfaces such as edges, corners, threads, and generally just interior surfaces. Okay. Durability and abrasion resistance were the prime reason for hot dip galvanizing or specifying hot dip galvanizing for the city of Utado bridges in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria destroyed uh, that, that area. They needed a durable replacement for the future that could be installed in the winter and then hot dip galvanizing was able to deliver that with a tight turnaround time of six weeks. Hot dip galvanizing is also commonly specified for um, areas where great longevity against atmospheric environments is required. Corrosion rate is going to depend on a number of factors, but primarily temperature, humidity, rainfall, sheltering conditions, um, exposure conditions, uh, sulfur dioxide or presence of pollution, and air salinity. If you have a general sense of the atmospheric environment that you are constructing in, you can utilize the time to first maintenance charts uh, provided here by the AGA. This chart, what it models is 
coding performance under five general atmospheric categories, a rural, a suburban, a temperate marine, a tropical marine, or an industrial environment, and an industrial being the most aggressive, rural being the least aggressive. This chart actually models time in years until 5% rusting of the base steel, meaning actually 95% of the coating itself is still intact. <clears throat> For example, according to the primary galvanizing specification, steel a quarter inch thick or greater would be required to have a minimum of 3.9 mils of zinc on that surface, which means a maintenance-free galvanized coating, according to this chart, could be anywhere from 72 years in an industrial environment or up to 120 years in a rural environment, to give you a general sense. I'm demonstrating hot dip galvanizing's longevity in bridge projects are the bridges of Stark County in Canton, Ohio. Hot dip galvanizing was specifically specified for its proven longevity, and as a result, these short span, low clearance bridges have been galvanized for over 40 years without maintenance. This maintenance-free longevity experience with hot dip galvanizing over 100 refurbished bridges in the county has dropped maintenance costs significantly, and that allows you to free up funds for other and new bridge projects. Another benefit when utilizing hot dip galvanizing is its availability and versatility, both uh, as both iron and zinc are readily available resources in the earth. Hot dip galvanizing is also a factory controlled process and can be accomplished 24-7, 365 without any delays for curing. Afterwards, you can store the galvanized steel outdoors and you're not going to impact its longevity. And this allows you to create kind of a stock inventory that would allow you to quickly replace parts in the future uh, if you have a field repair. I don't know if this slide is loading, but it's a picture of the Jessup Bridge in Iowa. And in Iowa, this is an example of hot dip galvanizing's uh, availability, which was able to lead to speedy construction. With the use of short span uh, steel bridge alliances eSpan 140 design tool, a customized steel bridge design solution was able to be developed in less than five minutes and without waiting for an engineering firm using this tool. Um, additionally, the selection of hot dip galvanizing also allowed not only quick engineering uh, from the eSpan 140 tool, but then on the uh, fabrication and installation side, hot dip galvanizing offered a quick turnaround, and this all allowed the bridge to be demolished and reconstructed in only a three-month time span. Next, it's important to discuss aesthetics, right, when we talk about bridges. Some bridge owners love the appearance of hot dip galvanizing. They think it looks natural, and they think it blends in with the environment, um, blends in with the surroundings. Um, and in fact, all hot dip galvanized bridges, um, over time, they're gonna take on sort of a matte gray appearance in about six months, two years, as the zinc patina develops. On the other hand, some bridge owners do not prefer the appearance of galvanizing, and they would prefer to paint or powder coat over it uh, to change the color. And that's what we call a duplex system. A duplex system does allow you to maintain the corrosion protection benefits of hot dip galvanizing, but instead you can choose a different aesthetic. Um, you can also benefit from a synergistic effect that occurs between the paint and galvanizing that will allow you to achieve increased longevity and about 50% increased time between paint maintenance cycles. The Bergen County Bridge in New Jersey is an example where that that we have that natural aesthetic, right? Um, you've got that gray uh, look to complement the surrounding vegetation. Alternatively, not all communities are looking for that natural gray aesthetic, right? So here is an example at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. They wanted a custom green color for the Thurston Avenue Bridge on their campus, but they wanted to also benefit from corrosion protection um, when road salts are used commonly in the winter over there. In addition to a customizable appearance, hot dip galvanizing also provides your project with a sustainable option for corrosion protection. Um, in addition to being natural and abundant, both zinc and steel have zero emissions during use and at the end of life. And then they are infinitely recyclable without the loss of any physical or chemical properties. In fact, steel is the most recycled material in the world and has a very, uh, zinc has a very high reclamation rate. 
where over 30% of supply is coming from recycled sources today, and that's increasing over time. This diagram here shows what a full life cycle assessment or LCA for a hot dip galvanized products look like. Um, basically, this shows the environmental impact over the life of a project in a diagram form. Um, first, on, on, in blue here on the left, this is the uh, production process. It includes raw material energy inputs, emissions during manufacturing. It includes recycling during production. Um, and this is outlined here um, in blue. But then the life cycle assessment looks beyond that at the actual use of the material shown by the red box. This includes the maintenance, which is often zero for hot tub galvanizing. Emissions are also zero during use since only the, uh, the byproducts are, um, the only ones involved are zinc and um, zinc corrosion products, zinc oxide, zinc chloride, um, zinc um, carbonate. These are all natural and safe for the environment. Finally, the end of life is also assessed, shown in the black box. Um, this is where you may have some energy to tear down and dispose of the product, but then there, the rest is 100% sent for recycling. And so as a result, there is no grave for hot dip galvanized products in that sense. In addition to environmental impact, it's also important to consider economic impact on future generations that are going to have to maintain of this structure. On an initial cost basis, hot tip galvanizing is often similar or less expensive than high performance paint systems, but actually provides further efficiencies in life cycle cost because hot tip galvanizing does not typically require maintenance during use. And this means the initial cost often is the life cycle cost. To compare the initial and life cycle costs of hot tip galvanizing uh, to other high performance uh, systems or even uh, metallizing, the AGA has developed a calculator which is available online at lccc.galvanizeit.org. And we have done a cost case study. Um, there are a number of parameters that you would consider if you were to look at initial versus life cycle costs uh, for your bridge project. Um, different factors include, you know, initial cost of materials, surface preparations, uh, whether that material was applied in a shop or field setting, and for hot tip galvanizing, this can also include things like pretreatment and labor. Um, life cycle costs uh, consist of the initial cost plus all of the added cost to maintain that structure over time, and obviously that's going to vary widely um, from corrosion protection system to corrosion protection system. Cost information for many coatings is readily available through published cost data, and also the AGA has cost surveys of the galvanizing industry as well. To give you an example, we conducted a cost comparison where the AGA life cycle cost calculator was used. And so for this study, we looked at a typical 75-year design life in a C3 or a moderately corrosive environment. Typical surface preparation and application methods um, in the shop were considered in order to provide um, a more realistic cost. So what were the results? Here are the results when the cost calculator uh, compared the initial cost of hot dip galvanizing versus a variety of other corrosion protection systems and even included a duplex system there, which you can see um, is quite expensive and is uh, the second most expensive relative to the others um, shown there at the, the second to the bottom uh, because technically you're paying for two corrosion protection systems up front and um, then hot dip galvanizing is shown at the top there and both cost per square foot and total initial cost are provided. Now what about life cycle cost? So this chart here shows what we got when we compared hot dip galvanizing to um, other coating systems over the life cycle and then also included those maintenance costs, right? When we consider the life cycle cost, hot dip galvanizing is the most economical in this project example when compared um, to others in cost per square foot, total life cycle cost, and average equivalent annual cost or AEAC. Even the duplex system, which was second from the bottom, which was very expensive initially, um, because you're paying for those two coating systems, like I mentioned, that actually comes in well under others because due to the extended paint maintenance cycles and overall extended longevity that you can achieve with the duplex system, 
due to that synergistic effect, all play into uh, reduced maintenance costs over the life of the structure. Okay, all right, next we'll move on to design details, which are specific to hot tub galvanized bridges. First, the key to providing the best design for hot tub galvanizing um, is open communication between um, designer, uh, engineer, fabricator, galvanizer. Each party should really be aware of the responsibilities and relevant galvanizing specifications. And you may also be interested to know that the AGA has specific design and detailing guidance specific to bridges, uh, which is available for free on our website as well. Specifically, it's important to be aware of all ASTM specifications related to the hot dip galvanizing process. On the left, uh, we list three main specifications that govern uh, the coating thickness, the adherence, and the finish for hot dip galvanized coatings. ASTM A123, that's the main specification for steel galvanized after fabrication. ASTM A153 governs fasteners and small parts where excess thread removal from areas such as threads may be required. And then ASTM A767 is for galvanizing of reinforcing steel bars and concrete. And we'll actually get more into rebar in the second half of the presentation, as well as the continuous process uh, in a different specification. On the right, this is what we're going to be focused on next. These are the specifications that the designer should really be concerned with. These supporting specifications cover best design practices uh, and also how to avoid warpage or embrittlement. They also cover touch-up and repair of galvanized surfaces and duplex coatings. So this next section, we're going to talk about kind of the, the meat contents of what are in those supporting specifications. The first is maximum steel size. Hot tip galvanizing um, is a complete immersion process which means all parts must fit in the galvanizing kettle to be coated. So you might be wondering, what is the biggest piece that I can actually galvanize? Well, the average kettle length in North America is 40 feet, but there are many 50 to 60 foot kettles um, and depths can range anywhere from six to 12 feet and widths from five to eight feet. There are options to galvanize bigger spans though. Um, you can use modular design and then bolt or weld after galvanizing. You can also look at a process called progressive dip galvanizing. That means if about half the part can fit into the bath, it can be galvanized on one side, rehung, and then dipped on the remaining surface. In essence, this could nearly double the size that could be coated. You can also look at a, a, a tandem coating. For example, this could mean galvanizing each end and then metallizing any mid portion that did not get galvanized uh, due to size, or it could be metallizing an oversized girder, uh, but then galvanizing all the rest of the bridge components. A great example of a bridge utilizing galvanized subunits is the Stearns Bayou Bridge. It's actually the first fully galvanized bridge in the United States, and it consists of two 60-foot spans and six 50-foot spans that were all bolted together, all of which were able to fit within the galvanizing kettle. The next topic to consider um, and discuss is uh, with respect to steel selection. These are There are recommended ranges for elements in the steel, such as silicon, phosphorus, carbon, and also uh, uh, manganese, which provide a galvanized coating of typical thickness and also typical appearance. Steel that are, that are going to be outside of these ranges, they're known as reactive steels. They might have a thicker coating or a rougher coating, but they're often acceptable. Uh, many steel grades common in the bridge market have um, a wider restraint on actual silicon content. And as a result, these steels tend to be more reactive. This isn't necessarily a problem, um, except for in cases where there may be a, a potential for excessively thick coatings above eight to 10 mils. Um, these coatings, excessively thick coatings, could be susceptible to delamination or flaking. Um, and then where, where there is an issue where silicon content is expected to be relatively high, abrasive blasting before galvanizing can be used to limit the coating growth on these steels to about 10 mils. Um, otherwise, staying within these recommended ranges uh, will provide you um, coatings that are going to be more typical in uh, appearance. 
The next design issue uh, to discuss relates to warpage or distortion of some parts upon galvanizing. Some fabricated structures and assemblies, they might distort at the galvanizing temperature as a result of relieving stresses um, during the steel production and fabrication um, that are residual within the part. Distortion is primarily reduced through design and fabrication measures that are intended to avoid or mitigate against high internal stresses. ASTM A384 is the specification which provides a list of design practices and fabrication techniques which make articles susceptible to distortion um, and, and includes a list of those, including the inherent stresses within the steel, um, any cold working or excessive cold rolling of the steel, if there's um, welding, welded parts, welded fabrications, especially ones that are asymmetrical in design. The combination of thick and thin materials in the same part, these can also be uh, products susceptible to warpage or distortion. The use of progressive dipping um, is considered an influencing factor simply because you're heating the part unevenly multiple times. And then also poor drainage um, and then uh, poor lifting or um, lifting points, uh, these can allow uh, zinc to clog within the part and provide excess weight that may introduce a bow into the material. These practices where possible should be minimized, but there are uh, mitigations that can be used as well. The best ways to prevent warpage and distortion is to minimize internal stresses overall by following those recommended design practices within ASTM A384. Uh, other mitigations uh, listed in this standard are to use um, bracing uh, to provide added uh, stability to the parts during galvanizing. Um, you also avoiding the combination of thick and thin materials, maybe choosing to combine those after galvanizing, and then also focusing on materials that are symmetrical in design. Where required, um, a heat treatment before hot to galvanizing can be utilized to relieve internal stresses in susceptible designs so that they can be successfully galvanized. Meanwhile, um, when it comes specifically to girder design, there are some key industry best practices uh, that can help maximize quality and avoid warpage. Um, first is to ensure any flange to web thicknesses ratios, uh, that those are no more than three to one in order to avoid, avoid distortion of the web. Um, the finished galvanized girder should also be air cooled instead of quench cooled after galvanizing in order to minimize additional induced stresses from cooling. Um, if you're going to be looking at welding or especially overlapping areas uh, where possible to use continuous welding or um, leaving sufficient gaps, such as a 3 30 seconds inch gap between overlapping surfaces, uh, these can be used to help prevent weld blowouts um, from, uh, that occur when zinc cannot enter certain tight gaps between those parts. Next, be aware that galvanizing also can potentially accentuate or remove a camber, uh, but this may not be a problem as long as the diaphragm members can be attached in a way that can draw um, the girder into place. Stiffeners, uh, they should be generously cropped in order to allow good venting and drainage of the part, and the galvanizer should try and minimize the immersion time overall. And then any lifting points should be placed at quarter lengths in order to avoid any sort of permanent deflection um, or bowing from the lifting process. Okay. There are just a couple more design considerations when specifying hot dip galvanizing for bridges. Um, these include um, details for structural joints in bridge designs, and these can help kind of save some time and money during installation. Um, so for the bearing type connections, Hot dip galvanized uh, coatings, they do not impact the overall design or performance um, or, or design strength considerations. As far as clearance hole sizing, standard holes should be specified, uh, but for bolts that are uh, nominal size one inch uh, or less, you may need to clear the holes after galvanizing to ensure um, the bolts can, can fit the hole. For slip critical connections, hot dip galvanized surfaces have a lower slip coefficient than bare steel surfaces or blast clean surfaces um, and then often painted surfaces. But these can be painted over with a zinc rich paint in order to increase the slip resistance significantly or these surfaces can be masked um, and then provided bare or painted as well. And so that you don't have a galvanizing just on the fang surface. 
Uh, for uh, clearance hole sizes, standard clearance holes are suitable for connections involving uh, bolts one inch or greater. Otherwise, you have some options. Um, you have the option to size holes one inch larger than the nominal bolt diameter to provide a clearance for a galvanized bolt. Um, so for overtime and after a few loading cycles, uh, there's actually a lockup effect that occurs with galvanized fang surfaces. They'll, um, they'll lock up, um, they'll almost need to be pried apart you know, upon deinstallation, and this, and this can help uh, greatly reduce the slip if it is allowed to sustain a few loading cycles to uh, achieve this lockup effect. When tensioning hot dip galvanized structural connections, a washer should be placed underneath the turning pieces in order to prevent coating damage during installation as well. The final design consideration for hot dip galvanized bridges that I'd like to review um, before moving on to hot dip galvanized rebar is avoiding embrittlement and cracking of the steel. This is an infrequent issue, um, and then although infrequent, if a steel member does embrittle during galvanizing, it's very often uh, the result of strain age embrittlement and not hydrogen embrittlement. Um, strain aging is a process where the steel becomes brittle in areas of high internal stress when they are exposed to elevated temperatures, such as those involved in hot dip galvanizing. Therefore, to reduce the potential for strain age embrittlement, all methods listed in ASTM A143, these are going to focus on reducing the internal stresses prior to galvanizing. All the recommendations are going to be focused around that effort. So for example, when you're bending steel, you want to try and avoid things like tight bend radiuses, um, and the bend diameter should be at least three times the section thickness, but maximized where possible if bending before galvanizing. Another area to address is holes. Um, drill if possible, or if punching is necessary on steels that are three quarter inch or greater, you can ream at least one sixteenth inch around the edge of the hole. Um, in general, we want to try and avoid excessive cold working, but if needed, a thermal treatment can be used to relieve stresses prior to hot to galvanizing in order to avoid strain age embrittlement. On the other hand, hydrogen embrittlement, um, this could occasionally be the culprit, but um, not typically unless um, galvanizing materials with ultimate tensile strengths above 170 KSI or any material with a very tight grain structure, which could entrap hydrogen from the pickling process used in the galvanizing pretreatment. Generally speaking, hydrogen embrittlement is not a concern for typical products to be galvanized. But for steels that are above 170 KSI, ultimate tensile strength, um, this is where we would, would investigate uh, alternative cleaning methods um, that can be used. And that is what's used to galvanize these articles um, overseas. Okay. All right, that wraps up hot dip galvanized bridges. And then now I will briefly cover uh, the specification and design of hot dip galvanized rebar. Uh, please feel free to keep asking questions about hot dip galvanized bridges. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to move forward with the information on rebar uh, for those of you involved with design and specification of bridge decks or even uh, reinforced concrete bridges. But first, what's even the purpose or benefit of protecting the rebar that's used in concrete? The reason we want to protect the steel reinforcing bar from corrosion is because, generally speaking, corrosion is costly, right? Concrete is porous, and so it does allow corrosive elements like road salts and pollutants um, to seep down and attack any sort of rebar within, and that results in corrosion and eventually cracking and spalling of the concrete. Right now, the U.S. spends $2.2 trillion um, each year managing corrosion through replacements, repairs, upkeep. Uh, however, other costs of rebar corrosion include a waste of natural resources, hazardous failures due to severe corrosion, and indirect costs related to things like road closures. If we can protect that rebar within, um, then we can achieve longer design lives and lower maintenance costs. Depending on the porosity and composition of the concrete, that concrete is eventually going to allow those corrosive elements uh, to enter and hit the steel. Uncoated rebar is going to start to corrode um, as soon as it is depassivated. But the corrosion products are actually greater in volume than the base steel. So the corrosion products that build up between the steel and the, um, and the concrete, that adds a lot of pressure and that starts to build on that surrounding concrete. 
After a while, that pressure becomes too great and the concrete cracks and then eventually spalling occurs. But if you can prevent that voluminous and pressure building iron oxides from forming on the surface of the rebar, you're on your way to greatly extending the life, the design life of your structures. For example, you could hot dip galvanize the rebar. Hot dip galvanized in 1973. Uh, this is the Athens Bridge here in Pennsylvania. Um, inspections show that it's still in great shape with another 40 years to go until consumption of just the galvanized coating. So galvanized back in 1973. So despite the presence of high chlorides um, and a corrosive environment in that type of application. So there are definitely advantages to providing protection against rebar corrosion. And you can see there's projects where uh, greater longevity can be achieved. But why hot dip galvanized rebar? The first is hot dip galvanizing provides those three levels of corrosion protection uh, to steel that I mentioned before, that barrier protection, cathodic protection, and the formation of the zinc patina. Um, and then hot dip galvanizing performs that uniform coverage um, over all surfaces. But specific to rebar, there's also no fear over UV, UV degradation or uh, reduction in service life. It is if it's stored uncovered or outdoors, um, so it can be readily um, you know, um, displayed out at the job site, uh, ready to use without fear of handling concerns. But that's not enough, right? You also need good bonding between the rebar and the concrete for reliable performance. Research proves that the fully developed bond strength of galvanized rebar is equal to, but often greater than black rebar bond strength. What that means practically is that the overlap length of bars and all other design considerations, they're going to be the same. So whether the bars are uncoated or hot dip galvanized. Next, rebar, uh, hot dip galvanized rebar offers further protection because the zinc corrosion products actually migrate towards the concrete in a different way than iron oxides do for the uncoated rebar. Zinc corrosion products are actually less voluminous than iron oxides or, or steel corrosion products, and they disperse away and actually migrate into the concrete and even fill the pores of the concrete in the nearby area. What this means is that hot dip galvanized rebar eliminates that large buildup of pressure that causes the cracking and spalling I showed you earlier with the uncoated rebar. So you would not see cracking and spalling of hot dip galvanized rebar until all of the zinc uh, coating is consumed and then you're starting to see corrosion of that base rebar underneath. And despite these advantages, there are often concerns about zinc's initial reactions in concrete uh, because immersion in wet concrete is a really alkaline environment. Uh, and alkaline environments are typically not considered suitable for hot dip galvanizing. While this is technically true, attack on the galvanized coating stops as soon as the concrete hardens. And then that has a negligible impact uh, on the design life in that short time period. Afterwards, the performance of hot dip galvanizing works differently in concrete than if it is just exposed to the atmosphere. For example, black steel is passive in an alkaline uh, concrete until the chloride concentration level exceeds a, a certain threshold, about one pound per cubic yard. Then we know that the black rebar starts to corrode. Meanwhile, zinc can withstand a chloride concentration in concrete, which is two to four times higher than black steel. So this actually delays when the coating will start to corrode by several decades. To explain, I just wanna show you kind of a, a diagram using real world data of two, two bridge decks um, reinforced with galvanized rebar in different types of high chloride environments. One is the Boca Chica Bridge exposed to a coastal marine environment in Florida, and the other is the Tioga Bridge in Pennsylvania, which is exposed to regular use of de-icing salts in the winter. With historical data, the chloride concentrations were plotted, and then these bridges were not expected to reach that chloride threshold for the onset of zinc corrosion until 78 to 104 years into their life. Once that chloride threshold is exceeded, the model shows that the zinc coating will corrode at a rate of approximately three microns per year. 
But that depends on the amount of moisture in the concrete. It depends on the wet and dry cycles, cracks in the concrete, uh, the concrete cover, use of concrete additives, and other factors. Uh, once the zinc coating has completely corroded, then the steel beneath becomes exposed to those chloride ions, where significant corrosion of the steel is not predicted to occur until over 130 or 150 years into the service life of each respective bridge. This high uh, threshold for corrosion to begin on galvanized coatings in the concrete is the primary reason why we say a 100-year service life can be achieved with hot-tip galvanized rebar. And so armed with this type of information about longevity and cost, it's easy to see why hot-tip galvanized rebar could be specified for projects that were meant to last. Um, for example, we have here the Governor Mario M. Cuomo Bridge in New York. Um, this was a concrete bridge structure built to have a 100-year design life. And to achieve this, um, part of the project included 68 pile caps and 134 girder assemblies reinforced with hot-tip galvanized rebar, in addition to 43 pairs of concrete piers. Galvanizing's high chloride threshold is also the reason it was specified for the I-85, I-385 gateway project in South Carolina. This is where we had different types of road salting occur during the winter that often wreak havoc, havoc on a black rebar that's used. And due to the proximity near the Atlantic Ocean and salty coastal environment, Hot dip galvanizing was also specified for the Panorama Tower in uh, Florida, and the same group will build additional towers in Miami for that reason. Moving on, there are even more benefits to this durable coating. Uh, hot dip galvanizing is a factory controlled process. Like I mentioned before, it can be performed 24-7. Um, and there are a variety of galvanizers throughout North America. Uh, that can apply this coating, making it a very versatile and available material. Zinc solidifies upon withdrawal from the bath, so there are no delays for curing. Galvanized steel could be realistically galvanized and shipped to the site and erected on the same day. On the other hand, if the galvanized material does not need to be installed immediately, I mentioned before it can be easily stocked or stored because UV rays and other types of outdoor storage are not going to degrade the coating's integrity. And because the zinc corrosion products migrate away from the rebar into the concrete, danger from cracking and spalling do not occur until the galvanized coating is consumed. Often that does not even begin until 100 years into the service life. Finally, galvanized rebar can also help you achieve a sustainable design providing both environmental and economic benefits, similar to what was achieved for bridges. Both zinc and steel, again, they're infinitely recyclable without the loss of um, physical or chemical properties. And the coating typically does not require maintenance or energy input after it is installed. So this maintenance-free longevity means that the environmental impact over the life cycle is equal to the initial impact. In terms of economic advantages, uh, galvanized rebar is often competitive or less competitive than other corrosion protection systems on an initial basis. Um, then because galvanized rebar is so durable, additional costs during the construction and installation are minimal or not, no, no touch up um, may be required. Oftentimes the life cycle cost of galvanized rebar is the same as the initial cost. This slide here shows the relative costs of available forms of corrosion resistant rebar on a per pound basis where hot dip galvanizing is only slightly more than epoxy coated rebar and still remains one of the more cost effective forms of protecting steel and concrete. This next chart shows the same data, but then applied to a typical bridge deck example, 180 feet by 180 feet. Due to efficiencies in design and overlap lengths in comparison to epoxy rebar, you can see that hot dip galvanizing can be competitive, if not less expensive than epoxy um, can, uh, from project to project. And this doesn't take into account additional benefits um, associated with life cycle cost or place cost, which include handling and touch up. Next, we'll just talk about some of the design and specification details, which are important to consider um, once the decision to hot dip galvanize the rebar um, has been made. 
For specifying the actual hot dip galvanizing process, there are three main specifications that govern uh, the coating thickness, the adherence, and finish of the galvanized coating. ASTM A123, this covers rebar connected to steel fabrications or rebar fabrications. ASTM A767, this galvanizing standard covers the use of galvanized rebars in concrete. Um, and then under this specification, um, rebars can be bent before or after galvanizing. But if bent before, there, it will stipulate minimum bend diameters to avoid embrittlement. And then ASTM A1094, this covers straight lengths of rebar with zinc applied in a continuous process prior to fabrication. And I'll go over the general requirements of each in the next few slides. Rebars galvanized to ASTM A767 and ASTM A123. Um, with these standards, you would follow the same batch process that I mentioned before. Placement into a series of pretreatment tanks and then immersed in a galvanizing uh, kettle. Alternatively, the continuous galvanizing process or CGR under ASTM A1094, this involves rebars that are placed in individual lanes, then blasted clean, fluxed, and then they're heated, and then they're actually sent through a trough of zinc and then wiped of any excess zinc by your knife. The metallurgical reaction between the rebar and the molten zinc is similar to the batch process. It just doesn't take place as long because of the relatively high speed with which the rebar passes through the zinc alloy trough. So this results in a mostly 100% zinc galvanized coating consisting of a very small percentage of alloy layers. Um, there are uh, requirements related to um, chromate quenching after um, galvanizing, and this is a process used to control initial reactions between zinc and concrete, which could interfere with the, the bond strength or overall longevity of the rebar. Um, ASTM A123 and ASTM A1094, they do have requirements for um, chromate quenching after hot dip galvanizing in order to uh, limit these types of reactions. Um, however, the, these requirements could be waived. Uh, and in fact, many domestic supplies of cement mixtures already have sufficient chromates to limit these reactions from occurring. However, if you are using a rebar uh, that has been you know, uh, out in the field for several weeks to several months, uh, the, the passivation from the chromate quenching does not last uh, longer than about that time period. So you would need to check to make sure that the presence of the chromates is still there. Uh, otherwise, you could add chromates to the concrete mixture. Um, international supplies or concrete supply to states um, with higher uh, environmental considerations for those types of materials, uh, they would also need to be checked to make sure that sufficient chromates are in the overall solution in order to limit these reactions. Uh, regarding mechanical properties, hot dip galvanizing does not affect um, the overall ductility, yield strength, uh, tensile st strength, or fatigue strength of the base steel um, upon hot dip galvanizing. Um, the only difference would be for articles that are um, uh, heavily bent or uh, minimum bend diameters are not adhered to, um, then these can result uh, in strain aging. But overall does not affect the properties of the rebar itself. Next, reinforcing steel to be galvanized, um, it needs to conform to um, one of uh, ASTM A615 or A706 for material requirements. And these specifications cover composition and material properties that will help ensure successful galvanizing. Another design consideration would be to look at any contact um, with dissimilar metals, such as bare steel or stainless steel or a combination of other rebar materials um, in the concrete. Best practices include the use of all galvanized um, uh, solution, including supports and any accessory items such as tie wires. You can also utilize uh, dielectric tapes to insulate materials uh, where uh, dissimilar metals will be um, involved. Or you can also look at other alternatives such as increasing concrete cover to slow um, the rate at which you know, the chlorides are able to build up in the concrete over time. Hot dip galvanized reinforcing bars, they can also be successfully bent prior to galvanizing or 
after the coating has been applied. If you are going to be bending rebar before hot dip galvanizing, I did mention before the minimum uh, bend diameters for rebar. Um, this is provided in a table to you in ASTM A767. If you need to bend tighter than these radiuses allow, um, there are stress relieving procedures which can be used, and then that way you can avoid uh, issues with strainage and brittlement. If you are bending rebar after hot dip galvanizing, uh, you do not have to worry about a minimum bend radius. That is because you've already exposed the rebar to the heat of the galvanizing process. However, for ASTM A767 class one coatings, uh, these are a bit thicker uh, coatings and cracking and flaking of the galvanized coating at the bend area may be an occasional occurrence. Uh, but generally the hot dip galvanized coating is better maintained at slower bend speeds. If some cracking or flaking of the coating does occur in the bend area, if bending after galvanizing, this isn't a cause for a rejection. And that coating in that area, it can be readily repaired. If you're working with ASTM A767 class two and ASTM A123 coatings, or if you're working with the continuous rebar galvanized to A1094, these, uh, with these coatings, you have less potential for um, coating damage in the bend area due to the presence of thinner alloy layers and then reduced overall coating thickness. Um, if some cracking or flaking occurs, again, with these products, you can just touch those areas up after, uh, after bending. Um, once in the field, um, so after, after galvanizing, uh, we're in the field, there are some other considerations that will also help uh, with optimizing quality. If you're welding, um, you can look at using slower welding rates and maintaining proper ventilation in order to avoid zinc metal fume fever. If you are considering um, overlap lengths, remember that overlap lengths are identical to uncoated steel rebar because of the equivalent bond strength to concrete. Finally, there are no special procedures for outdoor storage and there are no special handling requirements in comparison to black bar. If needed, uh, you can touch up and repair um, at the job site uh, using a variety of materials, um, most typically a zinc rich paint um, that is provided or uh, applied in accordance with ASTM A780. There's material requirements for repair in that standard and also application instructions. But the galvanizing standard itself is what will tell you um, how thick to apply that, that repair material. All right, that wraps us up for hot dip galvanized rebar. Um, but what I'd like for you to take away um, is that protecting the rebar with hot dip galvanizing, this can provide you benefits in terms of corrosion protection and longevity. And in addition to initial and life cycle cost benefits due to those maintenance free properties and, and low environmental impact um, all together in one package. I also explained that hot dip galvanized rebar it's readily available, it doesn't impact design with regards to uh, bond strength, and it's a sustainable construction material and that can be considered for a variety of applications and bridge decks and overall just bridge structures. So with that, um, we'll, we'll follow up with any questions that you guys have um, on the presentation, either the bridge uh, portion or uh, the rebar portion. Mm -hmm.